Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you're joining us. I'm so excited to be moderating this conversation today. Um, as Adria mentioned, this is really a continuation of at least WPP celebration and recognition of both International Women's Day and US Women's History Month. And today we have the opportunity to really speak to our esteemed panelists um, about the challenges that they face in their careers, the obstacles that they have overcome to get to where they are today. And they are also gonna share some advice and support um, and guidance um, based on the lessons that they've learned um, along the way. So I'm pleased to be able to introduce you um, officially to our panelists. Um, we have Jackie Canny, who is the Chief People Officer at WPP. We have Tripti Lochan, co-CEO of VMLY and R Asia, and we have Luciana Rodriguez, CEO of Gray Brazil. Um, so welcome, welcome panelists. Very happy for you to join us. Um, we have some questions um, prepared that we wanted to talk through today, but also be leaving time at the end um, for Q&A as Adrian um, mentioned. So if there are places you want us to dive a little bit deeper, we will be happy uh, to do that. So we'll go ahead and get started. And I do want to have a, a fun icebreaker um, with my panelists just to start. Um, WPP has recently partnered with Google on their I Am Remark uh, program, which is really focused on empowering women and various underrepresented communities um, within organizations to really highlight and celebrate their achievements and really not only in the workplace, but really and beyond. Um, so along that line of thinking about how we talk about and cultivate um, and empower women, what is your superpower and how did you start talking about it and how to, how to cultivate it? Um, I will move around the clock, but I don't know who wants to kick us off with that question? I can get started. Um, I think my superpower is a pedestal knocker. Yeah, I thought of this word just as you asked the question. Um, I think it's uh, really the superpower of being able to get a diverse set of talented people together read the dynamics in the room and focus them on collaborating without ego and expertise getting in the way towards a common goal while having fun. I'm having the fun. Um, this also means sometimes that you have to be badass and knock people off their pedestals as soon as they try to get on it. Um, it's kind of a character sculpting thing. I love that. I love that. Uh, great way to kick us off, Tripti. Jackie, I saw you unmuted as well. Did you want to chime in? Yeah, and I feel like Tripti, I want to, I'm drafting off of your superpower that I feel similarly. I, I reflect on whether it's WPP, Walmart before that, or Accenture, the companies that I've worked in. Um, I've really been excited to bring people together and get the best out of everybody, but then recognize what people can do together is always better than what they could do by themselves. And when, whether it's, you know, WPP plus Google, like you said, Azure, or with the One Club for Creativity, those are just more examples of how I think we can be using our superpowers. And then I'll add one more. I am a working mom and I do think that's a superpower. And I have two kids, they're 17 and 21 right now. And I think back to the pandemic pre, you know, pre pandemic, what we were doing and we were at an international women's day, it was joyous and great and fun. And then everything happened and my daughter was in Spain. And all I could think about was getting her home safe and sound while taking care of the 17 year old. And at the same time, thinking about the 100,000 people we have here at WPP. So I think being a working mom really gives you the talent you need to balance across some hard times. Agreed. My cape is behind my desk. I, I hear that <laughs> loud and clear, Jackie. Luciana? Um, so my superpower is to build bridges, to close gaps between companies and objectives, companies and audiences, companies and causes, and above all, to unite people with the same purpose to work towards a common goal. And how I cultivate this it's all about resilience. You know, I, ha I had some friends in US, they call this resilience because uh, otherwise uh, it's impossible to thrive. You really need to be resilient. And I have just a little piece of advice, which is do not talk 
about your superpower. Live it. Just live it in everything you do. That is uh, perfect. You know, when I was thinking about this, I was, I was sitting on the couch, I was asking my husband, what is my superpower? You know, when you think about that, you think about the things that you're good at, the things that you know are developmental, you want to close the gap, but it was hard for me to think about that. And I decided, I don't have a cool name like Tripti, but I decided it was just my ability to really sense and understand and empathize with how people feel, which has helped me, I think throughout my career, really build relationships. And I cultivate that by picking up friends. So before this, um, this session today, I really hadn't had a relationship with Tripti and Luciana and even A. Adrian, who opened the call for us, but now we're all going to be friends. We have opportunities to connect all going forward. And I think that that's something um, as you think about the connections between people and making those meaningful um, relationships over time really um, allows you to tap into that superpower. So kind of along those same lines, um, as you think about, you know, your careers, I know you all started thinking about, you know, the, the time it took for you to get from where you started at the very beginning and, and to now. Can you Tell us a little bit of a, maybe a personal story that you wouldn't mind sharing about your career experience that maybe was a milestone or a critical tipping point, if you will, um, on your journey and, and really what you learned from it. I see Luciana nodding. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> I think I'm going to get it started. So I, I love sharing this story because uh, it was so meaningful, not only for me, that's the thing about the stories that, you know, somehow it spreads the word and go like way beyond. So when I was like mid thirties, uh, I've got promoted while I was on my second maternity leave. And, you know, to be honest with you, it was the first time that I hear such an amazing story. Uh, I remember one day I was at home with my three years old girl, my three months old baby is Sadora. She's almost nine. And the president of the agents, he called me and said, hey, I wanna pay you a visit. I was like, this is awkward. What is he gonna do here? <laughs> like, oh yes, absolutely, welcome. I'm so excited to share my beautiful babe with you. And so he started by saying, Lou, you've been doing an amazing job and we want you know, to give you the opportunity to be the leader of the entire client services area. So from now on, you're going to be in charge of 80 people. And uh, I think you can do it, right? So ladies, to be honest with you, I was like with two babies, I was like, oh my gosh, I felt so empowered inside and outside. I was like, oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely, I'm gonna hit this. And then when I got back to work, uh, I remember like um, later, like a an year, a year and a half, I started doing the same. It is the virtual circle. I remember like a year later, I promoted a pregnant woman. And I remember like I had already 20, yeah, 18, 18 years in my career. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna start doing this and I'm gonna show that we are able to do both. So I think I, I really love to share this um, example because for me, the question for us leaders and for everyone that one day is going to become a leader, what do you do with your influence? What do you do? So it's kind of uh, impacting other people's lives. It's just, start doing something that the other are going to look at you and say, oh, let me try this. So I'm so proud. I, I think like it's been like nine years since then I promoted like a pregnant maternity leave women, like more than 10, 12. And, and I say because others started this virtual circle. So I, I love this personal story. And I, I really hope like if you watching us, you can do the same, trust. Thanks, Luciana. Um, go ahead, Tripti. I was thinking about that. It's such an incredible story, Luciana. Um, my, um, you know, career defining moment was actually slightly different. And um, it was around the same uh, 
same-ish age, maybe I was in my late twenties and it was my third job actually by then. So it wasn't that straight out of you know college or something. And I was in a scenario where I brought a lot of passion to the workplace. I loved what I was doing. Um, I worked hard. I was ready to take on more. And of course, automatically assumed I was going to be recognized and everything was just going to fall into my lap. When the uh, opportunity for a more uh, senior role came up, however, I was not given the job. I asked for a meeting with my supervisor. Uh, we had started, we started getting into a chat and I remember the room where this happened very distinctly because it was such a defining moment for me. And what should have been a structured discussion from me talking to him about why I deserve to get the job turned into this kind of righteous, but you don't see what I'm bringing. You know, it's, it was like, I implicitly expected him to just know that I deserved the job or I had passion for the job. And I took it for granted that I didn't have to sell it. And while this discussion was going on, I, I was in tears, very emotional, yada, yada. And my boss told me that I was high maintenance. He actually put it into my review. And I took that back with me. And while I was really mad at him for making me go through that, when I thought about it, I think it was a defining moment because I came away with the key learning that to win, you have to be smart. And you have to be able to be very conscious and aware of what you bring to the table and be able to communicate that in a way that is not an emotional uh, burden for people who do not understand emotion, which is usually our male, male colleagues don't do such a great job of it, you know. And I had to work in that skill. I had to learn how to be able to communicate um, in a very constructive way, what I brought to the table, what my goal should be, what I needed to do to get to the next point. So that was very career defining for me because I took charge of my own growth, which I hadn't done before. I expected everyone naturally just to see, you know, what I brought to the table and reward me. And I think on a secondary learning from this, I, when I have women and colleagues who come to me for advice, I always tell them this. I say, take charge. Tell me why you should have this job. Put it into a construct that it doesn't matter who you're talking to. You are doing that in a very logical and objective way. So that was very career defining to be called, uh, you know, a high maintenance person it was the first time in my life ever. Thanks for that, Tripti. And it's interesting because I think between you and Luciana's stories, I think just the element of, you know, feedback and being able to give feedback and receive feedback, I think there's there's definitely some good nuggets um, in between those two stories about how you live. And someone put it in the chat, living the example and kind of being um, who you um, want to be. And so I'm going to give Jackie an opportunity to share her story um, as well. Sure. Um, these are amazing stories and I'm so proud to be a part of this panel. It's really remarkable. Um, my story that I, as I listen to you guys, there's another one that comes to mind. I, I worked in one company for over 25 years and a lot of life was lived in those 25 years, including personally and professionally. And the choices that I made over those 25 years, as I look back, was really around growth. You know, I always was open to an idea. I'd give it a go, take a new role, work with new people, and uh, at the same time, make it work with my personal life. My husband was a Secret Service agent, so a lot of our personal life revolved around what he had to do and where he had to live. But in 2015, a mentor of mine, uh, she was the former CFO, came to me and said, it's time for you to like spread your wings. And I have this CEO you should meet. Um, and it was the CEO of Walmart. So I, 2015, went down to Bentonville, Arkansas. I'm a Jersey girl, so you can imagine that was a little bit. My mom was like, are you going to Alabama? And I'm like, nope, I'm Arkansas. Like if you fold the map in half of the United States, it's right there. So went there, heard about what Doug and Walmart wanted to do about transforming retail and the company. And it was all through their people. So I was so hooked. And I packed up and went there. 
And in my second month where we had talked about an investment of $2.7 billion in people, in training, in their education, and then their wages, our stock dropped in, we lost $20 billion in market cap. So I was like this wide-eyed, you know, comforted by one company person that was now physically in a new place, mentally in a new place, and felt so much responsibility to now step up to lead in what was going to be a difficult time because that much share price drop in a visible way with two point, you know, over 2 million people and what it meant to them to have a career, work, and a great company to work for was just daunting. And I look back and I, and I, you know, I believe that my, my boss, my mentor there, Doug, plus the team, we just galvanized and had the resilience to go forward as opposed to retreat and continue to invest in the people. And the, and the market came back, you know, rewarded Walmart, but I didn't realize just how strong the foundation I needed to be standing on when times happened, because you're going to get knocked and nothing like getting knocked in that way. And, I, and I'm really proud of the, those 25 years at Accenture that built the resilience, the testing, the mental, you know, but also the, what your values are. And that's the thing I'd say is like, Along the way, you got everyone out there is just building all of those muscles, and you're going to need them. Absolutely, I love that story, Jackie. And and what I heard, I think across all of your stories, and then if I think about my own, when I think about my my critical moments, I was thinking about my time at City when I first joined. It was 2008, and for those of you who remember back that far, um, that was when we were going into the recession. That Citigroup was considered the bank that was almost too big to fail. That we would collapse the financial system. You know, it was all these these things going on, and at the time, I kept thinking that this is the moment where I should be stepping out on faith and trying, seeking new opportunities and doing new things. It wasn't the, the time to kind of sit back and, and um, just let this, this time pass me by because I knew there was a lot of things going on. I think in all of our stores, we talked about stepping into roles, leaving, being comfortable or uncomfortable, depending on the case may be, to step into uncharted waters and really kind of lead um, through um, potentially difficult times. And I think there's there's um, a lot to be said there about thinking about taking new opportunities that may or may not be where you're comfortable and kind of stretching yourself. I think we all have done that throughout our careers. And I think it's probably made us, you know, much better leaders um, as a result. But I want to pick up something that you said, Jackie, really around mentorship. There's always a lot of conversation. There are there are many books, um, lots of research about the impact of mentors and also people who really sponsor you throughout your career, people who advocate for you in the room when you're not present. And so can you all um, give us um, a little bit of a, a flavor of how mentorship has played a role um, in your careers or in other cases, how, how it has not and, and how um, that support um, helped move you along um, through your career? I mean, I'm happy to take on that one. I, I don't know where I would be without my mentors. I really, you know, they're the people who are not just telling me when you're doing a good job, but they're telling you when you're not. And also when, you know, you're not taking the chances or really stepping into what you have the potential to do. So I have found that you can seek mentors that will tell you what you want to hear, or you can seek mentors that will tell you what you need to hear. And I'd advocate always to go find the ones to tell you what you need to hear. And I have had positive and negative, you know, kind of feelings about the moments and consistently, I've been working now for 30 years, there's, there's a few people that I know I can count on to do that. And then there are some others that, um, because of maybe the way I thought they were my mentor, and finding out that they weren't, I had one boss when I told him I was pregnant with my second, said, well, what's, how's that going to be good for me? And I was like, um, you could start with congratulations. <laughs> you know? And then we'll figure it out. But it, it showed the true colors, you know, of what he was there for. And my other mentors, I really believe are in it to help me not to help just them. Absolutely, Jackie, uh, great point. Tripti, or, Tripti please. Yes. Um, I, I think uh, just in terms of mentors, because we ourselves are not unidimensional, you know, I think we should pick a few, you know, we, we should pick people who uh, 
fulfill different facets of what we want out of our life. And that's to Jackie's point, it's the work life as well as our personal lives, because it's a balance, right? We are all trying to manage life, which is a continuum. Um, my biggest mentor, um, and I, I do want to talk about him, um, is my father-in-law, was my father-in-law. Um, and he came from a lineage of very strong women. Uh, he was brought up by when one, um, you know, uh, who was his sister, <laughs> you know. So um, he always knew uh, what was going on at my workplace. He would give me advice based on, uh, based on my work situations and always be pushing me. Um, and when I uh, quit work, uh, I did quit work uh, for two years after my first born. He was the one who was nagging and nagging. And he's like, when are you going back to work? And what are you, why don't you go and get a new certification? So he finally did the research, imagine, to come up with which certification I should try and go for so that I could rejoin the workforce. And then for me to be able to take that certification, he took leave from his workplace to come and babysit my baby with my mother-in-law. Um, I know that everybody is not, you know, as lucky or, you know, to have someone who wants to push you, to challenge you, uh, be supportive. And he did not mince words, you know, so he told you as it is, you know, as fathers do. Uh, this was my father-in-law. Uh, but it's been, it was, it's been phenomenal for me to have someone so close uh, who had uh, only my growth. And uh, he was the one who first told me, that if you are uncomfortable, it's, it's a very auspicious sign because uh, you're probably growing right that minute. So I always remember that line from him. That is great, uh, Chifty, and I, I love that. Um, if you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing. That might be a quotable. Uh, Luciana, um, how about from you? Yeah, no, I, I love this. And, and also there's also this quote, which I love and use it every single day with my team, which is growth and comfortable and comfort do not coexist. It means that, you know, in order for you to grow, in order for you to evolve, you're going to feel really uncomfortable. This is, there's no way out. It's just like, this is really important for everyone to understand because most of the time when you think and we talk about mentorship, it's about, like Jackie said, hearing things that you might not be pleasant. It's just, you know, kind of uh, candid feedbacks. This is so important. And uh, I, I, I don't know, but I, I think like uh, um, girls in this beginning of the career might be asking, so how am I going to find my mentor? This is not so easy. Shall I, you know, invite? So don't be shy. I, I wanted to start by saying, don't be shy. Uh, ask people do, that you admire and respect to be your mentor. I have, a, as of today, I have five, five mentors and they approached me, then said, and they're like from all over the world. I have one in Portugal, one that is currently living in Sydney, uh, one in Argentina. And they approached me and said, hey, would you mind? And I was like, oh, my pleasure. My, of course, you know, it's uh, in, in terms of timing. Uh, I, I somehow I adjust my calendar, but don't be shy. Go ahead, you know. And it, it, it is about people that you admire. And um, over this two decades, um, I have some amazing mentors like uh, my former boss that is currently also uh, my mentor. Uh, former clients, I have two former clients that are now like my mentors. So this is kind of, uh, you know, some, some mentors, they are just coming alongside others. You just speak, you need some advice. So there's no right and wrong. There's, I love Tripti's story because it's very personal. And if you are you know, fortunate to have someone in your family that can support you. And, and last but not least, it's about studying. Do not stop studying at all. Study. So this is my, it, 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 it is related to mentorship also.
That's, uh, that's perfect. Um, and, and I love that um, really so much because when I think about it, I, I think it was many moons ago when I was a, a, an inroads intern, for any of you who know the organization, it provides um, internships to um, high school and college students, at least it did back, back then. Um, um, I started as a senior in high school. I remember we did an activity um, just about um, our, our, our mentorship map, our networking map to understand like, do we have people who are aspirational to us as a part of our network? Do we have people on the side? Do we have peers? Do we also have people coming up that can share um, feedback and thoughts with you? And I, I want you all to definitely think about taking a very holistic look about mentorship and, and really ensuring that you can continue to learn. As Luciana said, I, I, I know personally, I'm, I'm teased often for collecting degrees and certifications, but I do think um, that you're hundred percent right that you know continuous growth and continuous learning and having that drive for learning, you know, really continues to, to serve you well. And also as you move around different networks and different different um, opportunities you engage with different people and then you can collect more people to help be mentors to you to be sponsors for you to give you those nudges like what Jackie mentioned when you need them uh, potentially to step into um, new um, positions so I'm actually going to transition a little bit because I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about really the current state of the world we are now at least a little over a year into our COVID-19 pandemic, which we know has been um, a significant impact um, just across the world in terms of how we interact with others, how we live our lives in, in so many material ways. But we also know that it has had a very disproportionate and severe impact, particularly on women. Um, and, I, and, I, and I don't want us to, to um, Missed the opportunity to talk about that because I think, you know, prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of conversation about female leadership and leadership style and the impact of having women in senior roles like yourself and what it means um, for business. But I'm just curious from all of you in the in the scope of kind of the pandemic, you know, what do you see are the, the biggest challenges right now for women um, really coming out of the pandemic? I know that if you read any of the McKinsey research that will have you very upset to say the least about just the, the loss in progress that we've had, but I'm just curious for your thoughts around, um, you know, what are our biggest challenges in returning to, to normal? I use normal in air quotes. I'll jump in. Uh, you know, this is probably one of the most important thing that I think think about as the people lead for WPP and how this pandemic has absolutely impacted women. But I also am struck by, you know, how there's the second pandemic that everyone is now calling a second pandemic around anti-racism. And I think when you put those two things to happening together in the world, and then you think about women and mothers and women leading at home or leading the, you know, their peers, it's, it's never neutral. So I think it's like more than a double hit, it's like a quadruple hit. So, you know, I don't have all the answers, but one of the things I do know is that if we lead by listening to our people and asking them what they need and then providing the environment for our women and particularly our women of color, to find their way to thrive through this is really important. So I'll give you two, two examples. One, we almost canceled our internship program last year and it was a reactionary thing to do. Everybody was talking about, you know, is this, we can't even bring people to the office, but instead we created a virtual one called Next Gen Leaders. And I was just hopeful that the 300 people that had signed up to be interns would sign up to be doing this virtually. It turned out though that we had like 900 people sign up and 71% of them were women and over 50% were people of color from over, you know, hundreds of universities. And that made me feel like the, the, the people are out there that want to work in our industry, that want to be a part of it. We just need to create different pathways. So I think think being creative as leaders is important to attract into the workforce and to keep into the workforce people that we need to be the best WPP. And uh, we're gonna continue that next gen program. But at the same time, we've also doubled down on inclusive leadership training, as well as opportunities for people to, you know, get more development opportunities that, that want it, like doubling down on that. So 
I, I, I'm not proud of the numbers that we have necessarily in our demographics, but what I do know is that we as leaders can take the steps to move and bring everybody back into the WPP family that we need. Um, and I think listening to our people will, will be how we get there. I love that, Jackie, spot on. Um, Tripti and Luciana? Yeah, I, I love uh, what you just said, Jackie. And I think, um, I believe that while we are trying to do the best we can uh, in terms of our policies, um, our support for our women, um, women leaders, I think a bigger part of the job is actually working on policies for men so that we can help them to participate as caregivers for their children, for their partners in every way possible and educate them on, you know, it, it's not macho just to work through after three days, you know, once your baby is born <laughs> um, or not to have the ability to take leave when your partner has had a miscarriage. Because I, I think our policies need to be looking at what we are doing for our men so that they can support their partners, their mothers, sisters, friends, uh, as they try to get back into the workforce in the best way possible. So I think besides everything else we are focusing on, thinking about policies, thinking about support structures, just conversations, you know, of when are you taking your paternity leave? When are you uh, going to take your family, you know, your father, parents for their jabs instead of your wife or your daughter taking them? I think those are conversations we need to have at the workplace. Uh, why is the natural default option for the woman to be the caregiver just because she has more empathy, you know? Um, I, I would attack that and I, in Asia, in BML Wine, we're doing that very, very aggressively. We had some of the best uh, uh, policies for paternity, um, you know, leave that you could break up into various blocks to support your partner and so on and so forth. I, I really encourage all of us to ask our partners to talk to their employers about it, not naturally assume that it is our lot to do this. Um, and don't let anyone ever tell you that you don't, you can't be ambitious because you should be, you know, this is a big part of who you are. So don't let anyone think, uh, let anyone tell you that you're not feminine enough or, you know, you're too ambitious or um, not accept you for with the equality that you deserve. That's my two bits on this. Yes, that was more than two bits, Tripti, and it was that was uh, amazing. Go ahead, Luciana. Yeah, I echo both Jackie and Tripti. I love what they just said. And, um, you know, what keeps me up late at night, it's just mental healthy. And uh, of course, here we are talking about um, moms, working mother, but uh, in general. So what Tripti just brought to the table, it, it's very, very important, you know, Last week, Rolling Stone, they, they've got this title, Coronavirus is Killing the Working Mother, and, and keep saying like a pandemic could force out of a generation of moms out of the workplace. This is horrible because, you know, at least in Brazil and Latin America, I have more experience with this market, um, women like in the middle of thirties, they really don't want it to get pregnant. They feel like, mm, you know what, so much work or my career or this. And with this information, with the Corona virus, it's getting worse. So I think us, like the leadership and our companies, um, we really need to start to listen to them and, and, and try to make them feeling more comfortable. And there is more things that we can start doing like flexible schedule, you know, that it, it seems like so small, but it, it's, it's huge. I have uh, as of today in my agency in Brazil, like six uh, mothers with the babies from eight, nine months to three, four years. And they really need to have uh, a flexible schedule. Otherwise, how they're gonna 
eat. They do not go into, you know, the, the, the child care. So I, I think it's, it's once and again, what are we going to do with, with our influence? And I'm really proud to be part of WPP because we have this full support that, guys, let's take care of our people. This is our precious. It's, you know, this is communication. It's all about people, all about people, right? I completely um, agree with you, Luciana. And and what what if you have read any of the articles or the thought pieces around what organizations can do? So much of it is around flexibility that we talked about, about focusing on wellness and well-being and mental health. I think, I think we can never overestimate the impact that this last year has had on all of us as, as individuals. And so I think always keeping employees center, uh, um, in the center of our plans, which I know Jackie for WPP um, does for us, I think that that is, is, is going to be important and critical for us as we move forward. I also think just generally speaking individually to Luciana, to your point and Tripti also to your point, I think we have to normalize the new normal. I remember in the beginning um, of the pandemic that there were leaders, both men and women that were apologizing for their children, interrupting meetings or coming into the room or standing next to them wanting to participate in our virtual meetings. And they would apologize profusely because they were embarrassed because that was the normal. The normal was not to allow the crossover between family and home, but literally these worlds over the last year have now collided. And so, so I think, you know, giving people space, I made a point to always tell people, do not apologize. This is the world in which we live and this is how we are gonna have to engage. And I think there's an opportunity for all of us when we see those needs for flexibility and when we see those behaviors that we take those moments really to um, normalize it and make it okay for people. Cause I think there's also a lot of pressure um, to um, maintain a, a certain cover and perception in, in, in the time and place where everything um, is colliding. And so I, I loved everything that you all said. And, and Adrian, I'm gonna move into the Q&A because one of the questions that came into the chat that I think is, is being upvoted um, right now is one of the questions that we had as well. So I'm gonna put it to our panelists and officially transition into the Q&A portion, which is, you know, people are asking, what is your advice for those who are experiencing burnout? And so, you know, I know that throughout this past year, we all have found different ways of coping um, with the things that are happening to us. But what do you do um, to practice what I call self-care, um, you know, in this time and, and kind of manage that burnout? I'm happy to jump in. You know, when the pandemic hit, it was March 13th. It was a Friday when we decided that weekend to put all of WPP at home in remote working because we didn't know how fast this virus was moving, how people were getting impacted. And we learned from China because they were experiencing those things first. So it was to be people led. But I remember deeply my family being in the house and I was working like 28 hours a day, not 24, but like as many as I could jam in. And I was stressed and I was like, nothing like this had ever happened before. I had a team that was sort of new. I'm the first people lead at WPP. So all of this was piled up into this very stressful time. And my husband said to me, Jackie, you can't work this way anymore. Like you can't, you can do this for the weekend, but you've got to figure out how to manage your way through this because you can't work in crisis for forever. And you don't know how long this is going to go. And you don't know what's happening next, next, next. And so I was like, oh, he's right. Damn. Like, <laughs> um, But it, it helped me recognize that if I was going to lead through a time of crisis, I couldn't be in crisis mode because it was impacting everybody else. So I chopped things up into crisis because there was real crisis. Then it was like, what part of the team's going to work to stabilize and then what part of the team's gonna to work to think about the future, even if it's 5% of the time, because we didn't know how long it was gonna be. And then I figured out, okay, once I could set things up that way, we could continue to move through that framework. And then I needed to go for walks. I would go for like a 90 minute walk with my earbuds and still do calls just to be outside of the home because I was losing, I was gonna <laughs> go crazy if I didn't. And, and I think I carry that, I, I got, a little lazy about that as the pandemic continued and I'm finding myself back into that. But I think I think it's how you organize the work in your mind and then how do you find an outlet? 
I completely agree, Jackie. That's great. Tripti? Um, I fully agree with what Jackie said and what you said, Azir, because unless we get deliberate big stones into that jar, we're going to fill it up with sand and the sand will keep coming and keep coming. Um, and what I mean by big, big uh, stones is, you know, that I'm sure of us, all of you've heard that story of big stones and then the smaller stones and then the sand into the box. Um, whether that's work or it's your personal life, you're going to have to find things that are important and that requires a fair amount of thinking and internalization. And you're going to have to remember that tomorrow is another day and it's not going, it doesn't all have to get done today, no matter what anyone says to you. I remember a meeting I was at uh, for just before Chinese New Year, which is the beginning of February, and we got a pitch brief from a client. And I saw one of the questions was around, you know, our, our industry and the high pressure from clients. And this was a high pressure from clients. They expected us to work through the Chinese New Year holiday because they were not in Asia. And, you know, everyone to stop doing what they were doing and to focus on getting a response to their requirement out to us. And on the pitch briefing call, I said, you know what, um, it's okay, you can take your time to send us the additional document they were supposed to send us. Do it just after Chinese New Year so that we can attack it with a fresh you know, mindset. Um, and you won't believe that every single member of the team sent me a private message of how much it meant to them, me just saying that. Um, it's a very small thing to do, but if we can figure out some of the big things we need to do, and then the self-care needs to be things that we do for ourselves. So like Jackie went for a walk. I do not approve of the earphones uh, listening to calls. Uh, you should do something completely for yourself. Um, and I picked up, um, I'm studying Buddhism. Uh, I became a qualified yoga instructor. Uh, and I'm doing a logic and debate course all through the pandemic because I was saving time that I would normally spend in airports and airplanes. And it just gives me the break I so badly need in my life to be able to cope with the monotony and the pressure of the environment that we are in, you know, with all the lockdowns and everything else. So finding some things that are unique, that will give you the thrill of learning something different, um, you know, sitting on stepping on that as your brief uh, removal from the pressures that you're getting can go a really long way. Completely agree with you, Tripti. Luciana? Yeah, I, I want to share with you guys what we did in Brazil. It's, it's been like eight months since we've started a mental health program, which means like we have uh, shrinks to help us out. So it's not about us trying to say, you know, to our employees, uh, do something different. Sometimes it, it is impossible. You just, you are under a burnout. You're not feeling like you cannot even read like a piece of paper. So it's been very effective, but I, 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 I truly recommend this kind of going into more, you know, like, um, not trying to, to do something palliative, but uh, just, you know, just implement a health program and it, it works a lot. Uh, we have a few employees in Brazil. They've started with shrinks like four or five months ago. They are keeping moving. I, I think this is so important because, uh, you know, if, if you work in, in a place that supports you, uh, that's what you're going to need. And, and last but not least, I want to share with you guys uh, this book and um, from Susan David. She's a psychologist for, from Harvard called Emotional Agility. And uh, it's just amazing. It, it helps us to understand like our emotions and uh, to embrace it. And there's this quote, which I love, which is like, courage is fear walking. So um, I, I really recommend you guys to go over this book. It, I, I started doing like my mother used to do, like I bought like 25 books 
and I sent away to all my friends because it was so impactful to me. Um, um, I think it, it's going to help everyone to go through this, you know, really hard time. I completely agree. And I know that in the pressures and you all kind of touched on one of the other uh, questions in the chat just about um, how do we manage our client needs and changing the mentality of our clients. And I think in, in tripting your example, just pushing out the brief um, that gave people a little bit more time to, to still celebrate Chinese New Year uh, made a difference. But I also want you, I, I want to take it down even to the micro level. What I've been telling people, I've been studying breathing exercises because I think a lot of times when we are under pressure and we are working and we're in the midst of it, sometimes we forget to breathe. Sometimes we forget to just take a quiet moment. And so even something, if you really don't feel you have space in your schedule, you have so many things to do, literally taking two minutes just to breathe deeply, just to calm down a little bit, will start to alleviate some of that pressure and burden. And I completely agree with you, Luciana. It, it's not only on us, there are people, we have support, um, particularly us in our organization, WPP, and I'm sure for many others um, working, that there are people that you can talk to, people that you can have these conversations with and, and kind of work through um, the emotions, the things you're feeling, that burnout, that exhaustion. Um, and it's, it's sometimes I think it's just, you need to take a break, whether it's going for a walk, whether it's talking to someone, just you have to find a way to break and take a break, take a deep breath and take a break. Um, One of the things, Audrey, I'd add to that for WPP and for people who are out there from WPP, we've really, Mark Reed, the CEO has been very vocal about the need for us as a company to talk about mental wellness. And we have rolled out with a lead from the UK and now in the US. And then as um, countries are, are getting on board, we're rolling out more uh, mental health allyship so that we can help our, each other. My next call is actually to go do a training about how to be an ally. And I think that there's there's opportunity at WPP, obviously, to continue to be better at that and build a community. But I think out in our industry, the more that we have these conversations and the more we provide allyship, we can help each other through, through times beyond the pandemic, because I think there'll be other stresses in our world after this too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I completely, I completely agree, Jackie. Um, one of the other questions um, in the chat, and I think it's it's really appropriate for us because we're coming from very different parts of the world in terms of where we work and what we support. But you know, WPP is a large, very large organization, and we are a global organization, and so we operate in many places around the world. But how do we, um, as an organization, would you say, and thinking about your own markets, how do we accommodate regional and local cultural concerns. And I know that's very, that's a very broad, whatever those concerns could be, that's a very broad statement. But if you can think about, you know, ways that, you know, you have um, accommodated concerns, particularly, I guess, during the pandemic that I think um, have made a difference for people. I think you've all touched on that in different ways, but I'll throw it back to the, to the panel. I actually would throw it to you, Azare. In your, in your, I turned the table a little bit, but I think you have such a great seat in how to answer that from your day job. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And so um, it's interesting because as the global head of DE and I, I had the pleasure upon starting. I'm in my sixth month now. Um, I created a, a, a global DE and I council where I have 75 employees from around the world that are engaged in the work of DE and I, and they have been extremely vocal, passionate, engaged about the things that they're seeing around the world. And so what I've been doing is listening. I think one of the biggest ways for us to accommodate any regional locals concerns is to listen. I think there's always a perception that some of our markets are bigger, larger, more robust, and they get all the attention, but it's very important to listen to our employees wherever they are in the world, because they are either experiencing things that are very similar and can use that support, or they're experiencing things that are very, very different. And we need to understand what those differences are. And so what I would say is the first and foremost is to listen and to really give a platform for people to raise those concerns. Um, one of the things that I did um, and I know this is um, on the smaller scale within H and K, but we we have started office hours. I make myself available for employees anywhere around the world to reach out to me to book a 15, 30 minute conversation just to share 
their experiences and what's going on. Something that if I have this in my mind as I go through my meetings with my chief people officer or with my CEO and my broader leadership team, I can see that feedback and input into our decision-making so that we are able to address some of those concerns that are bubbling up. And what I find more often than not is that these concerns, the, the world is, is shrinking in a lot of ways. And a lot of things that we're experiencing in the US or the UK or in Latin America are similar to what my colleagues in China, in other parts of Asia, um, in continental Europe are facing as well, maybe slightly differently, but we're all on this spectrum. And so what I would say is that as an organization, I think it's important for us to really listen and create a platform for concerns, no matter where they are around the world, to be raised so that we can um, address them. I don't know if any of my fellow panelists have any other thoughts, but those are, that's my two cents, my humble two cents. I, I love that. Uh, and I think the other big thing is once you listen, let, let more, um, not the most senior leadership, the next level and the next level down, participate in the solutioning. And funny story that, you know, before the pandemic, we had this task force which had decided they would come up with more engaging um, uh, work culture um, of their own accord. And they had come back with flexible working hours and you know very simple things like twice a week, you can work from home without explaining why, yada, yada, because that was not the norm. Before the pandemic, it wasn't the norm that you could just not show up at work and it would be okay, right? And when the pandemic really hit, a lot of the things that they had said, even before the pandemic, we were able to you know, lift and use those, but that was because not only do we listen, we, we need to have people in decision-making who are most affected and who think differently from us. I think the key thing about allowing differences to be part of mainline decision-making is, you know, that, that's what diversity to me is all about, you know, don't do what the common, uh, you know, majority wants, but what could be relevant uh, for a minority of any kind of any diversity, whether that's preference, color, and everything else. So listening and then allowing more decision making by um, the, the larger employee base. Absolutely. I love that, Tripti. And thank you for, for taking that a step further. I know that we are now three minutes um, to the end and I want to I wanna be timely, but I know that we are um, slightly flexible. So just, just really quickly, just to get some final thoughts from our panelists before I hand it back to Adrian to close. Any last thoughts, advice, wisdom that you want to communicate to our audience before we um, close our discussion today? This has been fantastic. And I thank you all um, just in advance for just your wonderful commentary and insights and really your, your openness to share your experiences um, with us. I think there are so many great stories um, out there and just being able to hear about them, there are things that we can learn um, for ourselves. So just any quick 30 second final thoughts you wanna share with the group, that would be great. I have one thought and ask, I, you know, this industry is based on creativity more than any other, I believe. And it, everything that we've learned this year is that we need creativity more than ever to solve problems, to make things that have changed for forever better and more delightful or, or even just you know fit for purpose. So my ask is that everyone who is part of this industry really double down on your creativity to help us solve, not just for this industry, but for all of our clients the problems that they have before them because they need you more than ever. Love that, Jackie. Um, I'm, just, I'm just going to talk about uh, 30 second, get comfortable with feeling uncomfortable, okay? And your, your anxiety is not gonna stay forever. Just get, recognize it and just say, oh, I'm feeling anxious. Something auspicious, I'm using my father-in-law's word, something auspicious is going on, you're growing. And keep, keep doing it, keep doing it. And you'll get used to that feeling and you'll start actually enjoying it. And you'll say, oh, I'm growing, great. I'm feeling uncomfortable. So go out into the world with that and keep making bigger versions of yourself. Awesome, I love, I love it, Jackie and Tripti. And I'm gonna wrap it up 
with my Beastie Boys amazing band. And they say, be true to yourself and you never fall. That's my message. Fantastic. Thank you, Luciana. Thank you, Tripti. Thank you, Jackie.